Trigger warning, Death and Friends is not a podcast for the light of heart. Many dark and serious subjects will come up. Listener discretion is advised. Why are we at a laundromat? Just be, just be cool, okay? Just be cool. What is password? Das Vidanya. That means goodbye. What? What is, what is happening? Okay, just give it a second. Just give it a second. This is this is the speakeasy. Uh, yeah, sure is, Nash. <laughs> Welcome to the party. Is that is that the Star Wars Cantina song? Uh, legally speaking, no. Jen? Hey, Jen. Keep up the good work. Wait, I I don't understand. Drinking is legal. I mean. Don't get me wrong, this is cool as hell, but... Unnecessary? <laughs> so you say, Nash. Like, don't worry about it, kid, alright? Just have a drink. See? Here you go. Thanks. Alright, this is called La Leche de la Fresa. Thanks, it sounds exotic. Alrighty, cheers. Bottoms up. Whoa, Nash, what are you doing? This is milk! Right. It's like strawberry milk. Yeah, I, I said that earlier. You f- Dude, I don't drink. Why did you think a speakeasy that served milk was a good idea? Because milk is the forbidden drink. Because you're lactose intolerant? I see it more as milk is tummy racist. Hello, Skeleton Army. I'm Angel, and that spoiled liter of milk is Nash. How much money did we lose on that investment, Angel? I don't know. That's legal. Again, I would like to remind you that I'm a lawyer, not an accountant. Also, profits are up 7% since we started selling lactate pills. See what I mean? Wait, wait, really? Right, right. Right, right. Um... In today's episode, we're talking about the most formative periods in American history. Disco? Sadly, no. Uh, we are talking about Prohibition. Prohibition? Yep. Prohibition. Okay, okay. Stop doing that. Doing what? Every time somebody says the word prohibition... It just, it just did it again. Your point being? Stop that. Okay, okay, fine. You're no fun, though. I just want you to know that. Good. First the milk, now this. Well, you go, go ahead. Go. Go ahead. You might as well paint the picture. Thank you. Thank you. I will. <clears throat> Prohibition. Uh. Prohibition gets enacted in the United States in 1920. Now, Prohibition movements are popular throughout this time period, just like Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh. oh shit! Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Keep going, I guess. Marijuana. <laughs> the man's. Ag- I'm just saying on the sidebar side. Pitbull yeah. is incredible because not only is he Mr. Three Hundred Five. Yeah. He is also worldwide. It's hard to be localized when you're worldwide, but he doesn't. I mean, if anything, he's saying like, yo, I rub my peoples, yeah, but I'm also for everybody. I mean, he does have white people speaking a tiny bit of Spanish. Dale. Pitbull is how we dismantle racism in the United States. Before the U.S. even enacts prohibition, Canada starts and stops, and the Russian Empire is just six years deep in it. Unfortunately, prohibition has essentially the same effect all around the world. Few years on, few years off. But culturally, it's still very much a part of modern American culture. It has literally changed just about every part of the American culture. Like everything? Everything. It all began with our dear... I'm gonna go with friend person who keeps inviting themselves to the party oh god is it kyle what no it's worse it's racism oh is it weird that i'm relieved incredibly 
the late 1800s and the early 1900s see a big influx of immigrants to the U.S. Irish and German immigrants arrive and they love to drink. But in their defense, pretty much everybody loves to drink. Everybody. This is not a unique experience to those specific ethnicities. But shitty attitudes towards those ethnicities, drinking is created by, you guessed it, racist. Kyle. Oh. Yes, Kyle. <laughs> Damn it, Sorry. Kyle. You are ageless. You son of a bitch. By the way, while we're on this topic... It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better in regards to racism. So heads up on that. The next big factor that leads to prohibition is something that on paper sounds like a good thing. Women's rights. Wow. Okay. I know how it sounds. I'm, wow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So this is an abridged version, but I'm going to try my best here. In 1873, women began protesting as part of the temperance movement. It had gained early headway in the earlier that century, and they eventually formed the Women's Christians Temperance Union, which had the ultimate end game of women's equality. The argument was basically that all these husbands are failing to provide, cause domestic violence, and to be honest, a lot of these cats were dropping like flies. Throughout the next few decades, WCTU make headway, leading to the creation of dry laws in counties throughout the U.S. While the momentum would slow down towards the end of the century, one man decides to do what men, usually of the Caucasian variety, tend to do. Take the credit from a minority group and claim it was their idea all along. Looking at you, Elvis. Looking mm. at you. And that's how we get to the creepy little bastard known as Wayne Wheeler. Very curious to see what white guy two names can accomplish. Wayne Bidwell Wheeler... Oh, there it is. ...is born in Youngstown, Ohio in 1869. From a young age, this walking scrotum hates drunks and, in turn, well, the source, alcohol. ¿Por qué? Porque when he was a kid, a farmhand on his family's ranch stabbed Wheeler in the leg with a pitchfork. Granted, that can be very frightening, but most people just kind of grow past that kind of thing, or they use it to better their lives internally. Not Wheeler! He decides instead that he must not let anyone have fun ever again. Classic. On paper, he's a modern-day conservative's wet dream. Mm. A humble farm boy who worked his way through college Ooh. by working blue-collar jobs. Oh my Ooh. god, baby. Oh. A conservative, pious man who joins an organization that helps the nation as a whole and ruins a few minority groups. Baby, please. Oh, is that your stepmom? Mm, right in the bussy. It is in 1893 that Wheeler joins the ASL. Age, sex, location, baby! But no, the Anti-Saloon League. Uh, oh, well that makes slightly more sense than him having AIM over a century early, I guess. AIM? What the hell is that? Please, please don't do this. After attending a speech by the Reverend Howard Heil Russell, Jesus Christ, these white guys with their names. After seeing his speech by this dude about temperance, Wheeler gets hired by him as a full-time employee and together... They create arguably the most effective lobbyist group in U.S. history. But let's rewind here for a quick second. The temperance movement that started in the 19th century comes from very real sources. As we already said, they worry about where society is going after alcoholism begins to grip the nation. Just grip the nation. <laughs> Just bear grip the nation. Just Yes. Right on the chest. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Without consent. <laughs> It's in there like swimwear. The WCTU worries about a whole host of issues and gets to work towards improving their communities. They create homes for women to get sober, create public access to water, and help teach kids the dangers of alcohol abuse. And they help create laws that curve alcohol consumption instead of banning it outright. I bet you're wondering how the Reverend Russell feels about all that. I mean, it sounds pretty great. Sounds like they're doing a lot of good work, so I'm sure he, I'm sure he loves it. Yes, yeah, so Russell believes that all that stuff was secondary and not important. The bottom shelf of alcohol problems. No one does empathy quite like a white man. Russell and Wheeler decide the DSL. The ASL, Nash. No. What? A. Oh. Jesus, oh, right. Nash. The, yes, the ASL is going to accomplish one thing. Hi, many. The abolition of alcohol from American life. Russell might start the fire, but Wayne Wheeler is gasoline. He also smells just like it. It's weird. And also a goddamn menace to those who enjoyed the occasional drink. And also probably everybody else. I like the idea of like he's waiting in like the halls of Congress and somebody's just walking by and they're like, he's here. <laughs> 
As he gets everyone on his side, he invents and uses pressure politics to get his pro-temperance officials in office. He fucking bikes. Oh, Christ, this guy. To every single speech, event, and political rally, oh. all while papering towns about the dangers of alcohol. They slowly but surely gain momentum as lobbyists begin to pass temperance laws and measures in Ohio. Mind you, all of this while earning his law degree. You see, parents... Only pieces of shit work this hard. <laughs> in 1898, after getting his degree, his power grows tenfold. And soon, after an insane amount of propaganda and pressure politicking, the ASL takes control of the Ohio legislature. And over the next few years, Ohio effectively becomes a dry state, while other states take notice, and slowly but surely, the movement gains momentum nationwide. Riding his bike back and forth and yelling about the sins of alcohol is apparently not the benchmark because this is in 2000s Cambridge. So how does he convince multiple groups of people? Six. He's 5'7", with a creepy face. Like, he looks like John Waters, but grosser. Oh. Yeah. So I'm going to guess he, like, lies to them? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Manipulation. The white man wave. He tells immigrants and black people that he would help them not fall into the traps of alcoholism perpetrated by a system out to exploit them. He tells racists that immigrants are drunks threatening the American way and that black people would become monsters and take their wives. Jeez. In 1917, an early version of Prohibition passed in order to save grain because... There was a little thing that was just a just a little widow thing. A wee baby, a widow baby. World War One. Yikes! Such yikes! Much wow. With the anti-German rhetoric up to eleven, and the Germans living in America brewing most of the beer, Wheeler saw this chance to strike. He had already convinced thirty-three states to pass their own prohibition laws up to this point. He just wanted that little extra push. But before it could be passed, they had to figure out how to fill a very large hole. hey -oh. Alcohol makes up 40% of the annual tax revenue for the United States. Wheeler, always the smart guy, introduces income tax. That's right. This creepy fucker created the income tax. And with that neat idea, the 18th Amendment passes on January 16th, 1919, going into effect the following year. In October 1919, Congress puts forth the National Prohibition Act, which provides guidelines for the federal enforcement of prohibition, championed by Representative Andrew Volstead, commonly known as the Volstead Act. And thus, 13 years of absolute fuckery begins. So, let's start with the Volstead Act itself. The laws are flawed, probably because it was written by fucking Wheeler himself. And thus, drinking alcohol is legal, but making and distributing it is illegal. Also, any booze you had beforehand was grandfathered in. So, like, a lot of places just bought a shit ton of booze right before it happened, and they were fine. And also, uh, guess what? Did you, did you hear about this? What? People's desire to stop drinking weirdly didn't go away. What? A lot of people brew their own booze, become moonshiners, bootleggers, damn near overnight, actually. Black market rose to supply people with that sweet, sweet taste of courage and forgetting all your problems. Wait, isn't, isn't this show called Death and Friends? Donde esta? Death? Stocky? Uh, no, here it comes. See, they're, they're right over there. See? There they are. Oh, hey. hey! Okay. So, let's start with the government. Oh, my. <laughs> yes, I believe it is time for... Fun Facts with Nash! The government catches on with the increased order of materials to create alcohol intended for a good time. Wheeler, using... What seemed to be his unlimited power in itty bitty living space pushes the government to intentionally poison it. Okay. Industrial alcohol is still being used by pharmacies and drug companies to make medicine and things. But Wheeler figures out that people would just buy the shit to get tipsy. So in order to enforce prohibition, which again, did not make consuming booze illegal, he purposely poisons the industrial alcohol to make people sick. But he poisons all of it, including products like soap, which also get this poisoned alcohol added to, to it. So a bunch of people get sick from either trying to drink some of the booze or just using products that have it in there. And by a bunch of people, I mean up to 10,000 people die because of this. You would think poisoning people would be like the worst thing he does. Mm. It isn't. Mm. 
Wheeler is such a fucking maniac, he decides the government isn't doing enough and he gets his own enforcement group. At this point, Wheeler has ironically become drunk with power. Thanks again for coming by on such short notice, Alanis. It's really helpful. It's often said at the time that if Wheeler doesn't like you, your political career is over. He manipulates so many groups of people, for example, by outright exploiting minorities for their voting power. He starts to hone his skills in his native Ohio, but by the time he makes it to Washington, D.C. to do the ASL bidding, this man is a master. Yes, and he didn't even have to use his DSLs. Wheeler is a man that always gets what he wants. DSLs. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> that felt gross just saying it. Disgusting, but true. The prohibition had led to something that Wheeler did not see coming, and that is organized crime. Actions have consequences? What? Prohibition leads to the insane amounts of widespread corruption in policing and politics, and all of this is spearheaded by criminals, but namely the mob. Do you, uh, yeah, did you hear about this? Al Capone? Snorky? Ba- shut up. Babyface Nelson? <laughs> Other criminals? <laughs> Fluffy? Cuddles? <laughs> Jeff the Dragon? <laughs> like, these guys did not pick cool nicknames at all. They really don't. No, just really lacking in the cool names department. The criminal underworld becomes insanely powerful due to bootlegging. They either make or find booze, they fund speakeasies and make millions of dollars doing it. The rise of organized crime leads to the rise of the intelligence community. The Bureau of Investigation is created in an effort to stop the pandemic of crime that was everywhere in the U.S. Everything that Prohibition sought to prevent literally becomes worse. Large cities got hit hard, and to these criminal organizations, it's cheaper to bribe officials than to outright fight them. Mm -hmm. If a law is created but not enforced, is it a law? Or is it dancer? Organized crime at this time quite frankly deserves its own episode. The important thing to note about this time in relation to this specific episode, though, is that... Hang on. uh, Let me check my notes. A lot of people die. The amount of violence due to the lack of regulation in the bootlegging trade led to insane amounts of gang violence. Different mob bosses being undercut and outright eliminated. Politicians being the epitome of corruption at this point, And not enough law enforcement to be able to handle the amount of crime. So instead of large trials and prosecutions, you just get a fine at this point And you're told to move on with your lives. Resources are insanely thin. Prohibition creates a lot bigger problems than it tried to solve to begin with. Which, by the way, did it even do that? Since organized crime is effectively taking the police away to enforce the laws, you bet you're wondering what control freak Wayne Wheeler does about this. I I guess he realizes that people just really enjoy drinking and that the harm that was created by the 19th Amendment overshadow any of the wrongs that he originally perceived. Right, Dad? He doubles down on racism. Picante. Baby Dick Wheeler decides he needs his own private security force to enforce prohibition. So... Like any reasonable person, he gets the one organization that everyone loves. Guess who it is? It's the KKK. Jesus Christ. (laughs) So the Klan prior to 1915 is shrunk to near non-existence. But then the film Birth of a Nation gets released. And it has got white people hornier than a nerd at a Star Wars premiere. Which is either way too horny or not horny enough. The chokehold that Birth of a Nation has on white people. It's truly impressive. The Klan already hates all immigrants, black people, Catholics. Wait, there's more on this list? Okay. Okay. I thought you fixed this list. Uh, Everyone that isn't white. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. They don't usually need religious motivation to take action, but with Wheeler and Prohibition, they use it as a thinly veiled excuse for violence and racism. And by action, I mean fun things like tarring and feathering bootleggers and anti-temperance movement candidates all the way to lynching black people for just fucking existing. They would regularly infiltrate and trash speakeasies, mostly to disrupt the incredible amount of racial integration happening. A huge benefit that comes from prohibition is the fact that a lot of racial barriers get broken down with speakeasies. Doesn't matter where you're from or what you look like. Do you like to drink? Learn the password and get your ass in here. You would think that would be the factors of the Klan, organized crime, and the failure of the income tax. Failure of the income tax? Well, Nash... In 1929, something kind of big happens. Ah, the Depression Grande by Taco Bell. (laughs) The Great Depression, with nacho fries, hits. The roaring 20s of industry, work, and a shit ton of money laundering. It's way deeper than that, but for the purposes of this episode, sure, why not? Has finally caught up to the banking system, and the U.S. economy does a crash. It do. 
Now, if the market crashes and the people have no income, right, and every year the percent of taxable income drops significantly, hmm. and the only person making money is a short, menacing Chicagoan who loves to be called snarky, what do you do? You invest in and also Jesus. No, dude, you decide to tax something that everybody wants and needs to holy hell and you make some fucking money. I still think is a sound investment. Jesus Christ. Goodbye. On December 5th, 1933, with a growing anti-temperance movement spearheaded by women and a government in desperate need of money, the 21st Amendment is ratified, repealing the 18th Amendment and thus ending prohibition. And on that note, oh, wait, you didn't, you didn't do medical facts. Also, what happened to Wheeler? Oh, that's right. We were talking about that guy. Yeah, who wrote this episode? Black Death Polio Spontaneous combustion Dying comes and after death Comes decomposition It may seem sad and also gross But here you are and here's your host Not an actual doctor But It's medical Medical, medical Facts With Dr. A Okay, so remember earlier when we said that Wheeler was a fucking weirdo that was obsessed with the complete removal of alcohol in American life? No. No, I don't remember that at all. Okay, so we mentioned that he had pushed for industrial alcohol to be poisoned in an effort to get people to stop drinking. So the government, with all that pushing and lobbying off of Wheeler, agrees to add all kinds of baddies to the industrial alcohol. Mercury, benzene, most importantly, methanol. By the way... If you're wondering, did anybody say anything? Yeah, they did, actually. Chemists and scientists were telling them the whole time, like, this is a terrible idea. No modern parallels. Of course, with their votes in danger and also their bribes, they went ahead and did it anyway. Which begs the question, what does methanol poisoning do to you? Symptoms of methanol poisoning may include passing out almost immediately, lethargy, vomiting, abdominal pain, blindness, and of course, kidney failure. It doesn't take much, by the way, even a small amount will low-key super kill you. When everyone is like, hey, uh, the fuck? He basically acts like a victim and points the finger back at everyone who died and is like, well, if they didn't break the law, they would have been fine, which uh, isn't even like true. You put it in soap. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so he gets canceled like that one season of Firefly. Hey-o. Wheeler quickly loses favor and political power. Everyone distances themselves from him like he's a terrible cheese. Even the temperance movement people realized that putting all their eggs in that basket was a lost cause. Wheeler leaves Washington, D.C., defeated. His wife and father die in a house fire, and three weeks later, Wheeler dies of kidney disease. Suck it. Mm-hmm. When Wheeler's death is announced, there are naturally many obituaries written about this man who had shaped over a decade of American culture and life. The New York Herald Tribune quotes, Without Wayne B. Wheeler's generalship, it is more than likely we should, nev- we should never have had the 18th Amendment. Ironically, his name is kind of mostly forgotten. Like, everybody knows about Prohibition, but they don't know about the dude, Crazy Sellet, who made it all happen. It took almost two decades of work, lobbying, making deals with doubles to have Prohibition passed. And he proceeded to disappear overnight, all but forgotten, alone in the sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> All because he couldn't get over some fucking guy poking him with a pitchfork. Which is ironic, because I bet that's what's happening to him right now. And on that note, that's the episode. A special thanks to you, our favorite listener. Remember to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A rate and review would also be nice. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Gorilla Jokes. That's G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A Jokes. And I'm at It's Nash Flynn, spelled exactly as you would expect. And of course, follow the podcast at Death and Friends Podcast. Want to become an official member of the Skeleton Army? Join us on Patreon. We use it to cover our sound guy's medical bills. In order to properly write medical facts, we expose Dom to all the illnesses and ways to die we talk about on the show. He's just, he's just pounding that booze, isn't he? Wait, is there methanol in there? Um, yes. Anyway, speaking of Patreon, let's thank our listeners at the Brendan Fraser level. We love you, Luella. So check it out at patreon.com slash deathandfriends. Also, we've got a website now, deathandfriends.org. That's dot O-R-G because 
we are committed to making the internet worse. On a quick aside, as some of you may have figured out, I am a friend of Bill's, and I in fact do not drink. And if you do, that's totally cool. We're not here to judge. We just urge that you do it responsibly. That being said, look, death, it's tricky to talk about. So please remember that you are loved, you matter. And if you don't want to be your own friend, we will happily be your friend. Haha, <laughs> I got you that far cushion you wanted. Very mature, Nash. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, skeleton army. Stay spooky. Love you. This has been a Knavery Inc. podcast. Go to knaveryinc.com for more details. Executive produced by Jacob Duffy Halbleib. Audio design by Dominic Guanzon. Themes and transitions by Amy Doe. The fuck is a knave? Remember this is a comedy podcast? Don't use it in your research papers. Mm.